Hey, good morning. How's it going? Like, so uh, hard follow-up. I, I mean, I, it's hard to follow you up. You have tons of enthusiasm. And I'm going to hit some of the passion areas, too. So thanks for introducing the idea. The first thing before I get into this, I really want to thank the organizers, the sponsors, and most importantly, the attendees. And there's a couple different reasons. One is I appreciate the venue that I have to share some of my ideas. And I think, as Sarah shared, it's really important not only for our city, but the region, for us to not just invest in things like QC Merge, but in ourselves. And by doing that, I think we're making it a better city, a more attractive place for technology startups and dollars to fund for investment purposes. And I think I want to acknowledge that, your investment in yourselves and in the region. So like, it's time to clap for yourself before we get started. That's right, you can clap. So my name is Marty Boyer. Uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer of Possible Worldwide. We're an interactive agency right down here. And we have about 1,300 people nationwide. We have 300 people here in Cincinnati. So a um, little bit about me real quick. As the Chief Product Officer, I'm really responsible for a number of things in our organization. It's technology, people, and process. That's kind of the areas that I lead within our organization. And as I've done that, I've really learned a lot about innovation and how to drive innovation, both at an individual level and an organizational level, and that's what I'm gonna share with you today. As I get into my presentation, I wanted to give you guys some information about it. If you'd like to uh, download it, you can see it's on my blog at martybytes.com. You can find me at marty underscore b. And uh, as I get into this, I really want to start with the first and most simple idea here. Let's examine the title. Feel my innovation. So think about those two words. Feel and innovation. Feelings. So feelings are something that's they're very hard to describe. There's about 590 words in English language, I believe, just for like bad feelings. So imagine all the when you and there's over 1,200 words when they good and bad feelings, but they're hard to describe. There's lots of language to describe them. It's hard to make people feel something. So, and it's a warm, sensorial type word. Now let's juxtapose that with the word innovation. Innovation is a cold, meaningless word. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. So when we see innovation, we recognize innovation, it's generally something we feel internally. It's not just something that you see and recognize, it's something you feel, and that's a really hard thing to ask people to do. So as we think about innovation in our lives, how do you get people to feel innovation? It's a hard task, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how I've approached some of that. As I get into this, I, I feel a need to share with you about some of the work we do at Possible, and this isn't a pitch, but I just want to share some of the innovations that we've done, just so you can get a see of how I'm applying this. So I'm going to show a couple minute video, and it won't go two minutes, but we'll dive in so you can see some of our work. So this is gesture-driven robotics that we've, we came up with with some off-the-shelf products, a Kinect and some fidgets and some actuators, so that we can control this, do something kind of interesting, cool, and control it without touching, touching items. It's just very simple so gesture. A few weeks ago, we were in a robotic. brainstorm, and we were trying to think of ways to uh, give kids superpowers, and how they might be able to achieve something they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And something came to mind from uh, earlier in my life. It was this cheesy movie called Dave. And in this movie, there's this uh, president impersonator who's at this car factory, and he's using his giant robot arms, and he's saying, I once caught a fish this big, and he's huge automotive robot arms are replicating everything he was saying. Something similar to that, to really allow kids to you know, have the experience of like picking up really heavy objects like cars or boulders and smashing them down. Something we wanted to do to make it more magical was figure out a way that we could recreate that experience without having to be uh, attached to any kind of levers or pulleys or anything like that. Something we've been exploring a lot lately is uh, using the Kinect to interact. So that's just a, a really 
easy example, gesture-driven interaction and so forth. And I'm going to use that example and talk about it so you guys can see how some of the innovation that we do comes to life. And just a few of the images here, so you let's see if my clicker here works. That's my range. This is some of our labs area where we're using the Connect to do count individuals who are in proximity to deliver meaningful marketing messages, to um, do proximity-based interactions, gesture interactions. Another shot here where we have a 3D MakerBot. We have uh, some augmented reality things that we're, we've been playing with as well, some shelf talkers, and then some actual products. So the reason why I'm showing these is so you can get an idea about where we started and how to think about like, some of the innovations I'm going to talk about and how we got there. So the thing about innovation that I want to share with you, in my experience, is a whole lot of learning went into these slides today. We screwed up a bunch of stuff. So you said fail forward. That's right, we fail fast. And we learn from that. And the way you learn is by practicing and doing. So we can lecture, we can read, we can do lots of things. But the most important thing you can do is practice and do. And the most important thing I can do for my organization is teach about it. And that's why I'm here today, and teach others about innovation. So there's a lot of things that went into today's slides. And as I think about this, what I want you guys to take away is really actions. Because those are the most important things. Buddha said it, I believe it. The most important thing that we can do is take actions and apply them and take ideas and apply them and not just have them as um, ideas themselves. So I'm going to hit it three kind of separate things today. I want to talk about key challenges. I want to talk about insights, some lessons, and a framework. Sorry, that's four. So there's four things I want to hit. I can't count. So let's hit this, the three key challenges. And I hit in my title. And this will work at some point. I always say the word innovation is a lot like the word love. It's something you feel. So as you ask, and how many people here have, are organizational leaders or help lead something within an organization? There's, there's a few, right? How many people are asked to innovate? How many people think that you can't afford not to innovate? Right? So. When somebody comes and asks you to innovate, where do you start? Like, how do you start doing that? That's a really fucking hard thing to do. When I ask my team, sorry, I'll, I'm gonna hit some F-bombs here. When I ask my teams to go build something, they're like, oh, what, what, where should I start? And when, it's like asking somebody to feel something. It's like the word love. It's, love's a hard thing to describe. It's, a, it's an emotional thing. There's all kinds of things that go with it. And the word innovations like that word. We don't know what it means. We don't know how to define it. We don't know how to communicate it that well. But we're still asked to do it. And when we ask people to innovate on our behalf, it's incredibly difficult to do. And I think we have to realize that. So that's a key challenge I've learned over time. And the second challenge I think everybody here is going to agree with is you don't have time to innovate. In a true survey that I made up for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to say 90% of you don't have time to innovate. But Who's the 10% here that say they have time to innovate? So I, I, I saw one, one hand. As I said, it was a true survey that I made up for, for the purposes of this presentation. So everybody says they don't have time to innovate, but you can't afford not to innovate. So hitting more juxtapositions, like, it's like feeling and innovation. Now we, we have to innovate, but we don't have time. Those are challenges. But how many people work in an organization with five people or more? Most of us, 10 people or more, one or less. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the reason why I, I asked that is, at the end of the year, how many people look back at their, whether it's time cards or services and where they spent their time and said, I, I wish I would have spent at least 60 hours doing something else, 40 hours. I'm gonna say the same 90% that said they don't have time to innovate would also say, yeah, I, I, I wish I would have spent my time somewhere different. Because we have thousands of hours in larger organizations that go unused and unbuilt you know, to our clients, or we, we're not really getting value from that. And so those were some of the three key challenges I, I really set out to um, solve when I started some of the programs and some of the innovations you saw. So then I, I really started and said, all right, I got to drive this using some insights, because as you 
think about personas even, you have to have insights about your users. And I, I have an organization that I have to think about. So what are the insights for my organization? So I looked at Google. Google's a pretty smart organization. They've done some shit really well over time. Like, what can I learn from them? That Google time. How many people here want Google time? We all want it. Can somebody tell us what Google time is? Exactly, 20% time. So, they, so Google time is about, they say you get 20% of your time and you get to go develop something you really want and something you're passionate about doing. And we all want to do that. That's what Google time centrally is. So as I began thinking about Google time and analyzing it in my organization, and even personally, I, I learned something really interesting. And maybe one of the more important things I'll say today is Google time is bullshit. Google time is not real. Google time is about your passion. Sarah said it, I agree with it. If you activate somebody's passion, they will find a way to get it fucking done. I promise you that. If somebody is passionate about achieving something, they will go do it, they'll find their ways on the weekend, they'll pull money out of their pocket, they'll go talk to people, they'll find the dollars to get it done. So Google time is really about activating passion. And that's something that I've learned how to tap into within our organization. And I think you can, as an organization, you can make it somewhat systematic and repeatable. You can't, you can't change the authentic passion that somebody has, but I think you can give them a really clear roadmap. And speaking of roadmaps, I think everybody needs a deck of cards. So I've talked about some ambiguous things. How about a deck of cards? What's beautiful about a deck of cards? is something really simple. It's a framework. Think of all the games you can play with a deck of cards. We can play gin. We can play poker. We can play, play pie gal if you're a gambler, like to sit at a table and drink, which is good. Or if I remember my, my brother used to play 52 card pickup, my favorite, right? That, so what a deck of cards is, is a way to communicate. It's a framework where you can change you can hand the vocabulary to somebody else, somebody else can engage with it, bless you, and then actually do something with it. That's something incredibly powerful. So it's a powerful framework and metaphor for how to think about things. And I realized that I, I owed my organization a deck of cards, a framework. So, so I've talked about some of the challenges, talked a little bit about some of the insights. Let me tell you about some of the lessons I learned and then we'll move into application. So key lessons we learn. We're in a contemporary arts center, a museum of sorts. Innovation needs a place to live within your organization. That's something I've learned that is so important. So every month, we, uh, I'm fortunate enough to the Oink Pug group here locally, that's the Ohio, Indiana, Northern Kentucky, PHP users group. That's what Oink Pug stands for. They come to the possible offices right down here on 302 West 3rd. And I have a labs area there. And what I, what I do in my labs area, I share it with our clients and our people. Obviously to inspire, delight, and inform. That's why I do it. What I've learned over time is that innovation in your organization needs a place to live. And that's what museums are about. It's a place where in something lives. And innovation in your organization needs to live somewhere. When Bobby down down the hall does something incredibly innovative, you need a place where you can look at it, celebrate it, and show it to other people, because Bobby's not gonna be there in six months. He may have moved on to something else. What, what are you gonna happen when Bobby's out of the office? Then you wanna show a client that great innovation. He's not there, it's under his desk and, or under some random server that you gotta hook up and hook into some like ethernet cord or whatever to get it hooked up, or you don't have the dongle like none of us all have. And I, I heard a laugh, so we, we have all lost a dongle or two. Um, it's a great word, dongle. But yeah, it's all right, we can laugh and have fun here. This is, you know, that's what we're here for. So innovation at your organization needs a place to live. And it's so important because really, it's like, I like to think about it like algebra. You gotta show your work. If you can't show your work and how you got there, you probably don't know how to repeat it. 
So when I think about innovation in my organization, I want to show people our work. I want to celebrate it. And that's really what a place where it lives, I get to take people through and celebrate the work, which is amazing. And then I use the principle of showing the work because it not, as I said, it informs, it delights, and educates not only our people, but our clients. So when we started this process and I, and I took over this role that I've been doing, what I learned was that we had four or five things that we could show people. Through applying a process, now we have over 50. And we get to show people work. And I don't even have enough time to take people through all the displays and presentations today. And as I said, a place where that lives, and I mentioned the Oink Pug group, is about every meeting now, every, every month, I tend to walk people through some of our innovations. So I like to show our work. I like to talk about it. I like to get people excited about it. And it gets some press. So you got to show your work at your organization. Let me talk, talk about smaller is better. So in the past, many organizations who want to innovate, they take on something very grand and very huge. It's like, I'm going to go change the fucking world. And like boiling the ocean is a pretty dumb idea because it's going to taste like fish soup, right? And the, a kid said that on Twitter the other day, and I was like, ah, oh, that's pretty smart. Like, that's, that's a smart kid right there. Boiling the ocean will make fish soup. Here's what happens. You take on a big challenge within your organization. Let's say it's going to take, I don't know, you have five people working on it, six months and 2,400 hours. What do you think happens over that six months and those 2,400 hours that, that I'm going to parse out with those individuals' times? What do you think happens? Boredom, loss of interest. What else? How about competing business interests? Something else comes along that I have to spend my time on. Or a, somebody leaves. What, do, what happens to the enthusiasm and contagiousness of that? What I've learned is that when you innovate, it really needs to be on a small scale. Many small things are great. And the reason why they're great is because A, they add up to a big change. B, they're actually achieving. People want to feel accomplished and achieve. That's a key insight. People want to achieve and accomplish things. And we have to give them the framework to do that. And when you can produce that in smaller segments, it's a much more powerful concept over time. You get a lot more of them. And, and that's a really good thing. And you don't have these big, grandiose projects that A, never get done. B, people lose interest for it, or C, you get a, like a competing business interest and that's how you core make money. So you have to go really focus on that. So smaller is better. So let's talk about invention or innovation. Like there's, there's lots of thoughts about this, but are you an inventor or are you an innovator? Very separate concepts. So innovation is really about application and diffusion. Invention is about creating something that's never been done. So you, we always like the Steve Jobs and Apple analogy where they, they took the, um, the mouse from Xerox Park. What, he, what did he do? He said, hey, I want to make one of these for under 15 bucks, and I'm going to put them on every computer. Great. He innovated. He, he didn't invent. He innovated. And that's an important distinction. I'm an innovator. Like, we've had times where we actually do invent things. But I'm not asking my folks to actually invent. I want them to innovate. I think it's much more important because there's a lot of other things for our clients. So I work at an agency. We're 300 here, 1,300. Our brands need scalable brand building technologies. And generally, inventions don't fall into that very easily. Or they have an incubation period that will take too long. So I really focus our efforts on innovation, and if we do have an invention, I might break that off as a startup or give that idea to somebody else. So I'm, I'm very cognitive of making sure we focus on innovation. So I believe innovation requires two things. I think it requires a skill set and a readiness, and I think it requires a problem to solve. It, it's very simple, but if you don't have those two things, like a problem to solve and a skill set ready to do it, I don't know how you're going to innovate. The reason I, in my background, I'm long a long-time developer. I'm a horrible developer. And I'll tell you why. I write shitty code that people can't read. 
And, and as developers, I'm sorry if you've ever had to pick up some of the crap that I've written. And I'm not good at inventing things. There are people who are much better at inventing things and working through code. I'm great at solving a problem, but I'm terrible at just like coming up with an algorithm that, that I don't really, like, I don't have a purpose to. I'm much better at just solving very simple problems because I'm not that smart. And not being, it, there's advantage to not being real smart. The, as I make jokes about that, you create simple frameworks. As you see from my PowerPoint to the framework that I'm about to show you about how to apply some of these concepts within your organization, it's simple and it makes it scalable. And that's what really makes it powerful. So let's talk about a practical framework. What's this look like? What's it feel like? So applying the concepts, like I said at the beginning of this, I can talk about ideas or I can apply a concept. I want to apply a concept because I believe that's much more meaningful. Let's talk about dope. And I'm not talking about weed or anything else. It's, again, it's okay to laugh if you, you know you got hemp plants growing in your backyard. I'm not judging. So, so it's an acronym, and it's a little bit unexpected, so it sticks with you a little bit. So the first thing I say is, you have to define innovation. That sounds so simple. So simple. So where are you going to spend your time? So you got your Google time. I gave it to you. You now, you get to activate your passion. You, you got your Google time now. Where are you going to go innovate? Where are you going to spend your time? You have to make a choice to do that. That's a hard thing to do. So I actually do that. So what we do is we look at it in a couple technologies every quarter and we define it. And I have two criteria by which I define it. Is it brand building is scalable? Because our clients want scalable technologies that we can deploy in, in like mass environments. So I put it through that filter. And that's really simple for a technologist. What if you do if you're a project manager? If you're a project manager or and within a PM organization, think, yeah, you, there's process improvement too. There's process innovation, there's technical innovation, there's idea innovation, there's all kinds of innovation that's there. If you're in an HR group, are you trying new innovative things, new ways to approach users? When's the last time you saw somebody from HR to users group? <laughs> Besides handing out cards trying to you know, fill a job somewhere. Like, as Sarah said, somebody who's coming with genuine interest about the, the people and the, the technology and what's going on there in a genuine, interested way, not some, somebody handing out cards looking for, to fill a hole at some company that can't find talent. So HR can innovate too. Everybody can innovate. You have to define innovation at your organization. And I think it's very important now that you have your Google time, you say, hey, this is where I'm going to spend my time. So you, you've defined it. So the second action here is, is super simple. You got, you got to tie it to your business objectives. Yeah, go ahead. On that, on that first one, defining. So you said you run through that filter of the brand building the scale. Mm -hmm. Can you define those? I mean, yeah, sure. Or, I mean, what, what's an example? Um, so I, I like to use examples that I show because I, I think you guys have a, a way to reference what I'm talking about. So I, the first one was gestural based interaction. And then the, the, when I showed the video, so that's gesture-based interaction. There are a number of frameworks, like open frameworks and, and so forth, that we, we've explored to enable us to do gesture-based interactions. Has anybody ever been to Vegas here? All right, cool. Most people have been to Vegas. Anybody seen the, the this from Monster Media, the games that are on the, on the ground that you kick the ball and so forth and you interact with? So that's just kind of a real simple thing about gesture-based interaction. What I love about gesture-based interaction is it, it doesn't require me to pull my device out of my pocket and, and start doing something. It doesn't require an activation point, right? It's just you walking by and you're like, oh shit, I can move. Like, I can interact with that. I think that's amazingly powerful. And I really find it amazingly powerful as we think about brands and how they do things. So I'm making a bet and I'm saying, you know what? In this gesture-based interaction technology, I'm going to grow our skills to do it. And when I grow our skills, I'm going to bet that our brands are going to buy that, and I have to be able to scale it. So I'm going to show you a case study in a few minutes of like, how something like that may have come to life for us. But, we, but I, I'm very specific about the, the technology of where I'm, what I'm going to grow. Um, and I, I'm very specific about the amount of time that I'm going to invest in it. Because then I believe after it's scalable, our clients will buy it. And I'll tie it back to my business objectives because it's going to drive revenue. 
It, it's very simple in, in that regard. I think you have to, if you cannot tie it back to your business objectives, you'll stop doing it. Like, because at the end of the day, we're all generally there to, to deliver against a very specific need value that we bring to our clients. And when we have, if we go outside of that, we, we lose the ability to do that very well. And so you gotta tie your innovation directly back to your objectives. Does that answer your question? I think so. I mean, you're saying, I think, I'm guessing when you talk about scalability, it's like that off the shelf component, too, right? Like, you don't have to manufacture your own connect devices. So that makes it scalable, right? So right. So it, it's good. Good question. So when I think about scalability, I, scale, I think about scalability in a number of different ways. So one is when you invent, invent something, it's generally not that scalable because it's the one thing you may have to go manufacture, may have to put it on a website or some, something like that. Sometimes it's not that easy to scale things. So it's, sometimes it's scalable architecture. So if I'm thinking about SOA services or something like that, maybe I'm creating a scalable architecture that's important for somebody to plug into. It could be um, scalable on our clients' platforms. So uh, something like this is like, hey, can I deploy this across 500 servers across the world? I, I will put it through that um, filter. And the brand building is, will people actually interact with it? You know, like, so it's, if people aren't willing to interact with it, kind of back to the personas for our brands, if they won't interact with it, it's probably not worth that much to me. And so those are kind of defining out the, the, a little bit of scalability. Does that help? Yeah. Cool. So I tie it to my business objectives. And the most important thing I do here, and if I would tell you guys, I think every presenter has like put a focus on something, it's this one. Projectize your innovation efforts. Whatever you do, you have to know where you're gonna start, where you're gonna end, and when you, where that midpoint is and how you're gonna celebrate success at the end of it. Because our clients, when you go to a client, you have to be able to estimate budget and schedule something. If you can't do those three things, you probably don't know how to A, repeat it, B, sell it to them, or C, value your time. And that's the most one, important one. You have to be able to value your time to sell it to your client and price it accordingly. So we projectize things and we say, great, we're gonna have, this is how long it's gonna take, we're gonna have a midpoint, and, we're gonna, and if it doesn't work, we're gonna abandon it. And so I'm gonna give you some of my recommended um, timelines for that. Fourth action is engaging everyone. I talk about showing the work. You gotta be able to walk your clients, your internal folks, and your staff, however your leadership, through the work that you're doing. You have to celebrate success. You have to put it on the quarterly slides, on the end of the year slides. You gotta point to the bright spots so that people will get there. If you don't do that, people won't actually do it. We will actually perform the actions that we celebrate about 70%, I think, is the statistic more often. So if you, wanna, if you celebrate something at your organization, you'll get a lot more of those behaviors. It's a really simple rule. The other thing when I talk about engaging people, what I do, and I'm very fortunate to have an organization where I can do this, is I award people value for their time. If you come, come to me, you can, be, you can pitch me an idea, and what I will do is I will give you an allotment of time and resource to actually go deliver against that idea. Now, it has to be pretty vetted out, kind of Shark Tank-ish. Like, yeah, you're not gonna, like, don't, don't come and say, hey, I'm gonna build this, you know, the next Facebook. I'm probably going to say no. But, it, yeah, it's a bad idea. Don't, uh, don't screw around with that. But if you say, hey, this is something I wanna go build, and I think it's gonna take me a couple hundred hours, I'm gonna, I'm gonna A, give you the hours to do it, B, I'm gonna give you the resources to do it. Like, you may need a designer, a developer, a UX, Somebody in you actually may need, may need a writer. So I'm able to do that. So I engage pe everybody in the organization within the process of innovation because I think they have something to bring to it. So this is what a quarterly plan looks like. And I'll tell you why this is incredibly simple. I go back to the deck of cards. When something's incredibly simple, you can repeat it as a business and you can do it uh, in a scalable way. And I mean, not just on one team, but many teams. So every quarter I select a couple different technologies. And out of that technology, what I do is, we create two projects. And I limit it 200 hours. Can't be more than 200 hours. It's where somebody can spend their time. Out of that, I expect a prototype. Really simple. You, I want a prototype that I can share with my clients. I'm gonna show my work. And if you can't do something within that 200 hours, it probably wasn't scalable anyway, or brand building. Now we've had some cases where that's over time it's evolved and we've had to revisit it. 
e.g. like augmented reality, how it's changed over time and evolved and new frameworks and APIs, they're, they're available today much better. But it's really about creating those projects and those prototypes. And then we add them to our lab store. So I, I talked about where innovation lives. I then take my clients through there. I've done over 75 tours this year. So every week, I think we're in week, what, like 20 something? I think it's around 20. We take about five clients through there. We take lots of people through our lab store and people get excited. I take the Oink Pug group through it. And what we've learned through that is people make comments about it. They ask about what's the insight that drove this? Tell me about the technology. And I can talk about like, A, how the insight that drove the activity, the kind of the, um, the scalability of it. But I show people our work. And that's a really important thing we are able to do. And then people say, you know what? Like, you know, I think I may want to buy that thing over there. I think I saw this problem with one of my brands, and I'd like to invest in that. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a great idea. I'd like to take some of your money and, and, and reinvest back in my organization. That would be a great thing for me to do. And then I add it to, to my clients as a strategic solution. So really, as a developer, this is the way I think about it. Learning, R&D. So when I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I just have a question. So let's say you're more of a, like you're more, you're not so, you're not so like into just playing with technologies, but more about like what, I guess what Sarah talked about before about just getting out there talking to users and solving the problem and stuff. Could you theoretically just take this exact same thing and replace technology with problem and then run through the exact same process and build products out of it? I, I would, I would apply it. I, do, I use it within our um, process management group. So I, think, I wouldn't say I, I build personas out of it, but I use it within our process management. Um, I encourage our HR group to do it. So there are a number of different organizations that report up to me, resource management, pro project management, and so forth. So we, we actually have a very similar framework for everybody. And everybody within my, um, who, who ends up reporting to me, happens to be about 100 folks on, um, on their development plan, kind of the yearly like review things that are always a bear. I have this very same process every quarter. And so I've systematically integrated as part of like a, the achievement of the organization. And so they have something every quarter they're required to have a technology, a process, or, um, a, uh, or an idea innovation. They then write this up. They deliver it back to the organization, both at a team and brand level for the within our organization. I don't know if that. It's not necessarily just just tech, selecting a technology; it's selecting whatever it is that applies to the field. That you know. Yeah, right. And, and the reason why I always say the technology, the hardest thing to do in innovation is define. If you don't define it, then it, you don't you're not really accomplishing much. You have to define it. Right. But if, and, you just, if you just focus on technology, you may never actually solve any of the problems that that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. you may Yeah, Thank you. yeah, and, and a little bit about that is like for the I think most people are fairly um, understanding within our organization of how many of their clients' issues over time, of the personas and the problems you do have to solve, and then as you grow your resources or skill sets, then you you're able to then apply the. Um, that resource slash skill set to it. So as, as I mentioned, this is the way I think about it as, as, a, as a developer. I really go from a learning stage of learning about a new technology, let's call it augmented reality, RFID, NFC, whatever it might be. And I, I mindfully explore it from a learning stage. And then I, as I begin to, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it, it's a good question about the, the doing does help innovate the, I guess the back to the personas. Within our organization, we have pretty long standing relationships with all the brands that are on your, their shelves at home. Because we have long standing relationships, we have pretty good understandings of like what their problems are. So as we're developing and we're mindfully exploring, we see like the, we understand the world with a new skill set and see the problems that we can go help solve. And thankfully, we, mo we have a lot of those to actually go solve. And then we're able to apply that new skill set to their problem. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna hit a case study in just one second, and I think it'll probably make it come to life. Good. Timeboxing the activity from a process perspective. 
perspective, uh, what, what do your developers feel about that? Like, you got to start now and finish in 200 hours. Oh, by the way, you got to be in the beta. Yeah, so the, well, the first thing on the innovation is like, not everything makes it out and it's great. Some things suck and we just fail forward and we don't, but we learn a lot from it. Augmented reality five years ago, I mean, we're, we're talking about like Second Life for anybody who might remember that, like old school stuff. Like, yeah, Second Life pretty much sucked, but we, we invested our time and we actually learned a lot during that period that came back around and we didn't adopt a lot of things there and we didn't um, use it. Yeah, the 200 hours. Yeah, it can piss people off. You're, that's a great, great point, 200 PM hours. But when I put it through the lens of if you can't achieve it and in 200 hours, it may not be develop, a developed enough technology where you know that you're going to be able to deliver something that's brand building or scalable. So the, the other thing I would add is that there are some times when we, at the end of a prototype phase, where they do like a very rough prototype that I, they're like, hey, I might need another, a little more time. I'm like, okay, great. You, you've shown the value of your idea. Let's, let's develop that idea. But if you don't put a cap at it uh, at the beginning, what you'll have is you'll get tons of great ideas that take thousands and thousands of hours that never get accomplished. You don't get to show them your client. You never feel like you achieved. And I think really it's about achievement and accomplishment that drive it forward. So from a developer, I said we talk about raw capabilities. And we add it to a strategic capability as we show our client and we, we then um, walk them through what we're doing within the innovation space and we allow them to engage with it. And then they decide to buy it and it's like, ah, that's, that becomes a pretty great solution overall. And what's it look like? What's it feel like overall? And I want to give you guys an example of it. That's this. It's called PopCam. We did this for Orville Redenbacher and we got some great press on uh, Wall Street Journal and all kinds of stuff. So the application is a number of years ago, we started investing in augmented reality, think Second Life, different open frameworks and so forth. And we all remember kind of the augmented reality of like where you, you're required a tag. So a tag, you need to have a black and white marker that activated from a camera and, it, and, the, and the experience kind of sucked. But it was kind of cool and that. Well, we've kind of moved a little bit forward, right? As we move forward, we said, hey, you know, some of these frameworks are getting pretty smart. So why don't we use our face as a, as a game mechanic, as an interaction point with the, with the game? That, that'd be a pretty good idea. So we said, all right. So we, we explored with augmented reality. We use open frameworks to do some cool stuff. Now, two and a half years ago, almost, yeah, almost two and a half years ago, I went down to an organization that rhymes with Pepsi um, for the brand name Hornitos. Um, and, uh, for those two organizations. And we showed something where those hornitos were flying out of the sky and we were catching them. And we, we were just showing them something. And I said, wow, I had, you know, SAP. And there, so we, it was an innovation showcase. And so SAP was there and all these great organizations were around talking about it. And it was like, I'm in a pretty interesting competition set. And these guys were all dry and not that interesting. And I had like 20 people around my booth sitting there catching like these Doritos out of the sky. Uh, well, Doritos wasn't that interested in it, and so we kept it, and we kept it as our prototype. We then got to show Joe and Chow, one of our tours, of that experience. And she's like, oh my god, that's so incredible. Because the greatest thing as a kid that you did with popcorn, you threw it up and you caught it in your mouth. Right? That was fun. That was cool. So what should we do with that? We were like, ah, it's, like how should we think about that? So I want to show you guys how that, something like so simple and an idea like that might come to life. And I, and I do need a volunteer here. Um, Sarah, you're up. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay. So let's see if I can get the screen res here. Uh, do I have to catch something? You do. <laughs> That's the deal. Nice. See if the screen res will work with me here. Outstanding. Oh, 
I'm going to weigh it. <laughs> you got to make a choice, right? You got to define what you're willing to play with. All right, so let's see if I'm on the network. It's always weird when you see the most frequently visited websites of people. It's like a, it's like an insight into their personal life that you don't know, right? It's it's like oh shit. Like, bad. And no you porn. Yeah. Mm, like, oops. And I don't think I'm on the network here. Let's see if I can join another network and maybe get to something here. Because I, th oh, I gotta agree. I, I I promise I won't go to that website. All right. I wouldn't do this if it did, if it didn't illustrate really the concept. Let's see if it, uncomfortable silence. Feel free to throw questions my way. Oh. Ah, thanks. That's why there's developers in the room. I love how everyone just says agree to that. You have no clue what you're, I always, I'm like, oh, agree, whatever. Yeah, 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 agree. They're That's... like, we've just liquidated your bank account. Agree. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me see if I can click. And if this doesn't work, I won't do it in a moment. I'll, I'll give it up. Uh, it, it, Mm. I agreed. You guys all saw me. I agreed. We we made an agreement. There, you're not living up to it, dear CAC Wireless. And CGI. Wow, I haven't seen that in a while. <laughs> oh yes. So we are now here, and I'm on a different. Yay! Yay! Woo! Now my, uh, I think my screen res is jacked up now. So, time to go back, fix my screen res. It's so hard, and the, the only thing worse than this is watching people type. Like watching somebody type is the most painful thing because we always fuck it up. All right, Sarah. So, here. What do I have to do? So, I'm going to come over here and we're going to make you uncomfortable and make fun of you. Oh my god, this is awkward. Uh, it is. Like, how do you think I feel? <laughs> um, so here, what you're going to do is, like, I'm going to click on your, your face here in a moment. I'm going to ask you to catch popcorn in your okay. mouth. All right, it's real simple. <laughs> so catch in your mouth. You're doing well. Like, not as well as my six-year-old Brady, but like. <laughs> so now you got to get a lot more. So you, you better speed it up there. Like, oh, yeah, so you so you did well. Good for you. But there's another level. Don't don't stop. You know, popcorn is a health food too. It, it's much healthier nowadays. Wow. Well, so so good job. So thank you. I'm not going to share that. Yeah. No, I, I promise I won't share that. Um, so that's a case study. And the reason why I show that case study and why it's so powerful is a number of years ago, we started with augmented reality. We knew there was these tag things going on. And we got smarter and the, the frameworks developed. And we were able to use our face as an as a, um, interaction device. And then I was able to show my clients this prototype. And I walked through. And imagine that now it's a lot more polished now, but they were able to interact with that in a great and engaging and meaningful way. I better turn that on. I'll unplug that real quick. And when I was able to show them that in an engaging way, they're like, I gotta buy that. So back to my my framework is I really selected a technology and it was augmented reality. We we knew the evolution of it, we defined it. We, we had a prototype, we shared it with our clients, we showed our work and we got them excited about the technology. We, we walked tons of people through it and we just knew that the moment somebody had that meaningful experience, we could scale and engage them in a meaningful way. And really, tie back to our business objectives is pretty straightforward. So as you leave here, 
I shared some of the key lessons I've learned. You see how some of that stuff comes to life. I showed you some of the pictures of the great technology. Remember the word dope. It's an easy word. You got to find where you're going to play. Tie it back to your business objectives. Projectize your efforts so you can estimate a budget and schedule it back to your clients and get value back for your time. And then really engage people in the process, whether you give people time or you um, walk them through like how you're innovating. It's very important to, to do that so then you get it um, delivered throughout your entire organization. And that is how I encourage people to help innovation, make people feel your innovation. That's what I got. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure. Do you engage people while you're working on these projects or just at the end? No, we, we certainly engage um, a number of people throughout the, the process. So sometimes we'll in, involve like interaction designers or we'll, um, the interaction designers are really the individuals today. It's kind of like the, the new breed of the designer with how they develop the interactions and then the visuals. So we'll do like um, really sketchy prototypes with, with ske sketches and paper and so forth and kind of like what the interaction layer might be. And then we'll kind of get people to react to it and then share it in like sometimes a lot of rough form and then kind of learn whether it's good or bad, kind of fail fast and then move forward. So we do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for asking that question. And, and the reason, so he, the, the question was like, do I constrain them to the 200 hours? Is it only for client-based work and client problems? No, I don't constrain them. I'll tell you why. I think developers are incredibly creative, smart people. They need the ability to have some freedom about what they want to explore. And I have to trust them that they're going to be able to recognize a problem that they can go solve. And I didn't say that, but it's incredibly it's an incredibly powerful point, and I'm glad you asked it because developers are incredibly creative people. And we, what, I, what I've been able to do is tap into that creativity, and then I trust that they see the world with a new solution set, and then they will recognize the problem to do that, the problem that they can go solve. And over time, things like that augmented reality, like we just showed, like we didn't say, that didn't come from, from a developer who was looking to do that. Two years, three years later is when we ended up building it, and they had the skill sets in their back pocket ready to go do it. And obviously the technology had developed at that point. But they understood, understood the principles and the, um, the interaction layer to, to drive that forward. So, yeah. Do you fail the hour races? There's some ideas that come back. Yes, <laughs> I do. That's a, and the, the thing is, like, um, I'll give you one example is, and I'm not gonna mention the brand we did it for, but we did a, um, a 3D printer. We took um, 3D images of individuals and we printed them on demand on site um, for an NFL game. And like, it wasn't necessarily a fail, but there's only so fast uh, that a MakerBot can crank out 3D images of people, and it's a it's fair it's a fairly complex thing when you have you know a, a sub you know a plastic substrate going through melting and then then going back up. But yeah, we have a number of things that we failed failed at, and we do have a gallery of that. It's like yeah, shit, you did, it just didn't work. One of the um, one of the things you didn't see here is we have like things laying in parts. Like uh, just like a gallery of like failure of like parts of things we we tried because as you as you may have noticed a lot of the things are ba not just digital interactions they're kind of digital physical interactions so from vending machines laying in parts to like weight sensors fidgets and all kinds of other things so yeah we ha we kind of have a museum of failure as well whether or not it's not designed to be a museum of failure but it's certainly there and we and to that point is we have a very common knowledge of things that we won't like attack right now because it's not developed. Because there's a lot of times where your client will say, hey, I want to go do this new thing. I, I read this great article on, you know, Mashable TechCrunch, insert, you know, publication name, and they really want to go do it, but it's not very developed and you shouldn't use it. So if you shouldn't use it, we're, we often will like say, yeah, let's not, we, we probably got six or eight months before we, we dive and we're ready when that comes along. Yeah.
What's that? Said there's value in that because if you don't know if six weeks from now, six months from now, there might be some technology or solution that comes along that eliminates that failure. Right. So there's a there's a lot of value in it from the, a the technology and the brand and kind of whether we can do it successfully. Separately, the I'll tell you a very important value that we get out of it is that developers, like a lot of times, the, the greatest thing we can give our developers is time. And developers need time to, to grow their skills. So at the end of the year, when they feel accomplished, like they've grown their skill sets, I, I think that's an incredible thing. And we were able to do that. So just by even failing and within a specific framework, we acknowledge organizationally it may not be ready to go. But we've also developed their skills overall. And I think I'm going to get run off the stage here in a minute. So if there's any, I want to be mindful of time. Any, any? Let me hit a, any more questions here. I see activity. You guys, think, am I off stage or we got time? Uh, any more questions? You can download the presentation I said on my blog and at martybytes.com. And thanks a ton for your time and your investment in yourself. So thanks. Thank you,